What's up, everybody? This is Gary Owen. Get some. Because I was talking about what I, the good things and bad things about being in a, in a interracial family, I guess, you know. One good thing, though, I, I, so I'm not using my advantage to having black guys in my family, man. Like, I remember my kid's cousin came to visit L.A. Never been to L.A. before, right? And her cousins came. So it was three teenage boys and me. And I've been sightseeing with them when driving around L.A. We was driving. And then uh, I accidentally, I cut these two white dudes off in traffic. It was my fault. I didn't put my turn signal on. And uh, I looked back and tried to wave. I was like, my bad. And I looked back and the white dudes are cussing me out. Fuck that, man. Fuck you. I was like, dude, my bad, you know? But the white guys wouldn't let it go. They kept riding my bumper. They kept trying to get up next to me. Like, they had to cuss me out because I cut them off. I just, I just realized, right when I got to the driver's side door, I realized, I said, man, these two white dudes think I'm by myself. They didn't realize I had three black guys in the car with me because all the black guys' chairs were leaned back all the way. Man, you should have seen how the whole situation turned in my favor when those white guys got up right next to the car and all the black guys popped up their chairs to see what was going on. They was like, hey, motherfucker!" Damn, it happens, it happens, yeah. We were probably speeding, yeah, so. You gonna get some gas at the next exit? I got my dad's gas card. Get some gas, get, get some Vita water. 50 Cent drinks Vita water. It's really good. Get it with Fritos. It's really good with Fritos. So, okay, no problem. Our fault. So, I just remember when they, um, you know, the, <laughs> I remember the, they black in the car. I said, "Why'd you pull your chair up? How'd you know what was going on?" They said they, they thought they heard the white guys say the N-word, and they asked me. They go, "Gary, what do you say?" I said, "I'm not gonna say it." So yeah, I'm not. <laughs> Whatever you thought he said, he probably says, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to repeat it. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is uh, Gary Owen with the Get Some Podcast. You can listen to this on iTunes. Uh, just search Gary Owen uh, backslash Get Some or search United We Cast or um, my YouTube page, youtube.com backslash Gary Owen com. Um, before I get started, uh, Two comedians, one's name is uh, Siddiqui Fuller, and the other one is Spanky Brown. Both passed away unexpectedly the same day. Spanky, I knew, I was probably a little closer with him probably 15 years ago. Every time I would go to like Macon, Augusta, Savannah, that area, he'd always open up for me at the comedy clubs. And he was a, he was a heavy set guy, but he had a really pretty wife, nice wife. Um, and I one, one thing I remember about Spanky was. We had a show, and then after the show, we all went back to his apartment, and uh, me and the other comics that was on the show, and we watched the Mike Tyson Lou Savarese fight. And uh, why I remember that fight so vividly is the week before. If you don't remember, Mike Tyson knocked Lou Savarese out one round. It, it was it was fast, and it was like in Scotland or Sweden. It was some some place in Europe. And what I remember about the fight is. We got to Spank's house and we had like chips and ordered a pizza. And we was ready to watch the fight and it was over with in like 30 seconds. And we were just sitting there like, really? And then, uh, so that was in Savannah, Georgia when the fight happened. Now I was in Phoenix, Arizona the week before that. And Tyson was in Phoenix. And uh, I remember seeing Tyson out at a nightclub. This was like Saturday. And I think he left Sunday to go to Scotland or wherever the fight was. And people were making a big deal about him traveling over to Europe and the time change and everything else. You got to get, your body has to get adapted to it. And the guy, the Lou Savarese guy that was fighting Tyson, he had been over there for like a month training, getting used to the culture, the time change. And Mike went over there the week, the week like five days before the fight and still knocked him out in the first round. And it's funny because Mike was out like hanging out <laughs> that Saturday. I didn't see him, didn't see him drinking, but just hanging out. Just like it's Saturday night in Phoenix. And I was like, it was crazy because then the next day he left. And I remember watching ESPN and they made a big deal about Mike Tyson getting there so late when the fight was Friday or Saturday and he didn't get in, get in town till Sunday. And, uh, so much for that, you know, loose that, that's the, that's the one. I remember when Tyson was getting ready to fight Lennox Lewis, I remember uh, Lennox just kept talking about Lou Savarese. <laughs> he kept telling Mike, I ain't Lou Savarese. <laughs> but that's, uh, that's, that's probably one of the most vivid memories I've had of, of Spanky. And like I said, it's, it wasn't a big deal. It was just some guys hanging out, but he opened his home to me and the other comics 
and let us come over and watch the fight. And I can't remember if it was pay-per-view or HBO, but uh, just like just a good dude. And what's strange is a couple weeks ago, I had talked about I had let my I've let my feature go. I, I got a, looking for a new opening act basically on the road. And when I was talking to the manager in Columbia, South Carolina, I said, "Yeah, man, I might, I might be looking for a new feature." I didn't get in details because what about Spanky Brown? He brings up Spanky. Spanky shoots me a text uh, that week and was just like, hey, Gary, I heard you're looking for a, a new feature. You know, I'm here for you if you need me. And I text him back, just said, all right, man, I'm just trying to um, get every, not like get my life together, but more like, uh, just, just, I was like, just give me a couple months to get uh, this new road crew I got and then I'll get back to you. And, and then he passed away. That's just so weird that his name came up and he shoots me a text. And then, then he passes away. It's just, you never know. And the other person that passed away was Siddiqui Fuller. Now, Siddiqui's a Bay Area comic, San Francisco, Oakland area. I met him probably 2005 or six at the San Francisco Punchline. And I remember he closed the show by doing a backflip on stage. Just standing there, straight backflip, backflip, bloop. And I, and I literally looked and I go, this motherfucker just do a backflip? <laughs> like I'm getting ready to walk on the stage. <laughs> he does a full backflip. And if you ever, if you've never been to San Francisco punchline, it's very low ceilings. I mean, the ceilings are probably eight, nine feet. So it's low. So for him to do a backflip the way he did it, cause he never like, he did it like he's already probably Sadiq was over six foot tall, easy. And he did the backflip where he never like jumped up to do it. It was like stand in place, back up. He's right back to where he was. Like he never went higher than his height. Come to find out. He was the Golden State Warriors mascot for seven, six, seven years. From 97 to 2002, he was the guy doing all the, the jumping. He got, it's got like a, a, the Golden State Warriors, their mascot's like Flash Gordon with a mask. And that was Siddiqui. And I think both those guys, uh, they're not household names and, and they, they didn't get to where they wanted to be as a stand up. I don't know if anybody ever does. I bet even Kevin Hart would say, I'm still not satisfied. But as far as like headlining and all the other stuff, they, they weren't there yet, but it was just, um, they were very respected and, and likable guys in the comedy business. And it's crazy when somebody dies and we say with, with shows on the books, like Spanky, his website, he had shows coming up in the next couple of weeks and he just passes away. It's, so it, it's mind boggling. I mean, Charlie Murphy died. I mean, all he worked all the way up to the day, the minute he died. Cause he still had dates on the books. But w- what I do want to say about standups and, and, and passing away is it's an easy business to get out of shape and to eat the wrong foods and everything. And the older I get and, and the more I'm on the road, now I see how important it is because, you know, it's wear and tear on the body on them planes, man. And, and you got to stretch and you got to like, biggest thing I've done is eliminate sugar and dairy from my diet. Ever since I did that, I just feel better. Oh man. But I did find something for, I do have a sweet tooth and it's hard for me to curve that. But I found these cookies and this isn't an advertisement. They ain't paying me to say this, but they're Quest. Q-U-E-S-T. Quest chocolate chip cookies. One gram of sugar. Uh, You can get them at Target. I found them at Target. And I follow... And I'm friends with Bo Casper Smart, who a lot of people say is J-Lo's ex-young boy toy. But Casper's a cool dude, man. He's a good guy. I follow him on social media, and I saw them. I saw him eating one one time. And Casper's in great shape. So I sent him a message going, yo, are those any good? He's like, they're the best. And so I looked them up, and I said, oh, they sell them at Target. I go to Target. I buy a box. I'm hooked on them now. Quest chocolate chip cookies. They taste like soft batch. I don't know if you guys remember the soft batch cookies. Man, those things are tasty as shit. I got the chocolate and I got the peanut butter. They were okay, but that chocolate chip quest, if you're looking to fit your sweet tooth, if you like cookies, get the quest chocolate chip cookies. And they're not paying me to say this. I'm just doing it out of my own goodwill. Because you, you wanna know who was a cookie monster? Was Michael Ely. Michael Ely, the 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 beyond good looking dude from Think Like a Man, Think Like a Man Two that I worked with. That dude could eat some goddamn cookies. I would be every time I saw him, like, cause you know, you you eat together as a cast at craft services when you're shooting. 
Every time we be at the craft service, Mike would get up and go over to the little cookie tray and just swipe two chocolate chip cookies. And one day I just called him on. I said, Mike, how many chocolate chip cookies do you think you ate since we started? <laughs> He's like, dude, I can't help it, man. I can't help it. In fact, I bought all the cast members, all the guys, I bought them all parting gifts, like gag gifts when we uh, when we got done wrapping Think Like a Man too. And I literally went to a grocery store and bought every chocolate chip cookie they had. And I put them in Mike's dressing room. He literally had like 18 different bags. I got Jerry Ferreira, the the Rocky uh, four... Four, there's DVDs. I got them. Rocky one, two, three, and four. A four pack of Rockies because we all said Jerry's like that. Um, Romney, I got them like these coffee enemas. Uh, somebody told me about them. Kevin, I got a big wheel. Terrence J, I got him the perfect push up because he had his shirt off of both movies. So, <laughs> <laughs> Those are my gag gifts. All right, let's get into the NBA playoffs. I think one thing that's obvious LeBron's the best player. And the Warriors are the best team. And I think how it's going to play out, uh, I think just like the NCAA tournament, we had all these upsets going on and watch out for this team. Watch it. And then when it was all said and done, Villanova pretty much was the best team all year. I think the same thing's going on in the playoffs. You know, we, Utah beats Oklahoma City and New Orleans uh, beats Portland. And we kind of drank the Kool-Aid. And then, then they run into... Houston and, and Golden State, you say, oh, okay. And even, even in the East, you know, you got these upsets. You got Boston looks like it's going to upset Cleveland and everything else. I go, dude, if it's Golden State and Boston in the NBA Finals, I might go to Vegas and put $1,000 on Boston. Just say, fuck it. Ain't nobody picking Boston or Cleveland. The only team that would get favored, and not favored, but people would think have a chance, would be Cleveland versus Houston. The people would, would think LeBron could, could – his his star power would outdo James and Chris Paul's star power. Uh, God, Cleveland's just got a bad – he's got a bad team. You think about Cleveland without LeBron. I mean, it is a lottery. It's Orlando Magic. That's who it is. I'm like, so it's clear he's the best player, but I don't think he'd be upset if they didn't make the finals. I think he'd rather go out to the Eastern Conference Finals and then next year – Get with, I mean, it seems the, the obvious choice is Houston if, if he wants to win now. Cause LeBron, I mean, he's getting up there in age. He's probably got about two years left where he's dominating and he's going to fall back or just, just retire. I don't know. But if he wants to win now with a team that's stacked for him to flourish is Houston. It's not Philly. It's not the Lakers, but it's so funny watching Stephen A. Smith on, on ESPN because he drinks the Kool Aid game to game. Because he went, Golden State is clearly the best team. Nobody's going to mess with them. Then Houston beats Golden State in game two. He goes, hey, if they let Houston play like they played in game two and rough up Steph Curry, watch out. They might beat them. I'm like this, dude, whoever Stephen A picks, go with the, uh, that's why if Boston plays Golden State in the NBA Finals, Stephen A Smith picks Golden State, that's the only reason I give Boston a chance. <laughs> But uh, what was the other big news? Oh, Phoenix Suns won the NBA draft lottery. Why doesn't Phoenix have a better team? I, I don't get it, man. It's a great city, especially in your early 20s, young 20s. You're single and got some money in your pocket. Who wouldn't want to go to Phoenix? Scottsdale. So you tell me you want to go to Portland or Milwaukee? Really? They, I guess they have their runs with Steve Nash and Barkley. But it's been about 10 years since they've been any kind of relevant at all. Uh, talking about not being relevant, Des Bryant. He turns out a multi-year offer from the Ravens, and now nobody, nobody can sign him. And he's like, yeah, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good with this. I'm like, really? Are you? Because uh, his productivity has dropped tremendously. And, you know, I think we're past that stage of giving wide receivers all that money. And when you realize you're really not as good as your quarterback, man. I mean, Brady, Breeze, you see they, they, they win with multiple, all different kind of wide receivers. And if you, if you want a wide receiver, you want one like Julio Jones or AJ Green that's just going to play and then roll out. The, the arguing, the diva, and the give me the ball, ain't nobody got time for that. The, the only team that should take Des Bryant is someone with a Super Bowl winning quarterback. Cause he's not going to listen. He's not, you know, he's, <laughs> even though Joe Flacco's a Super Bowl winning quarterback, I think the, the Ravens like, okay, we'll, we'll give it a shot. 
But I think they're probably breathing a little sigh of relief right now. Like, whoo, we dodged that one. I think the only two teams he can go to is Green Bay and New Orleans at this point. I've, everybody thought he was going to go to the Giants, but clearly they wavered. They're like, uh, unless it's one of those last minute signings like Terrell Owens signed at the last minute with the Bengals eight, nine years ago. Let me tell you something. When Terrell Owens signed with the Bengals, that was the most excited I've been since Ken Griffey signed with the Reds. I was like, no way. We just never had a superstar that was a superstar his whole career come to Cincy like that. I mean, we've had them homegrown. We, we built them ourselves. But it, ever since Boomer left, we ain't really had nobody. Like, Chad was his, his own entity. He came up in Cincinnati. But it's rare we had a free agent want to come here and play. And talk about a fucking fiasco. Best part about T.O. coming here is we dropped in the draft and got A.J. Green. Now, outside of Des Bryant, the Cleveland Browns signed on for hard knocks. And, and my thing is, a lot of people are like, no, nah, they got, I go, what the fuck they got to lose? You 0 and 16. You ain't been in the playoffs in 15 years. Haven't had a winning season in 15 years. You were never on hard knocks before. Why not? So when people are like, no, they just got to concentrate. No, fuck that. They should be on there. Get to know these dudes because you don't know. Only people you know is Baker Mayfield on the Browns at this point. And that's why I think it's good for the Browns to get on hard knocks because it's going to humanize Josh Gordon. I don't know him, but everybody that I, that I know that knows him was like, he's a good dude. He just has an addiction problem. And I'm like, uh, he's been so open about it. Not lying, talking about all his demons, what he did wrong uh, in college and in the pros. And he's like, now I'm, I'm ready. I got my head together. I'm ready to play. So if, if Hard Knocks is able to humanize Josh Gordon and he balls out, I mean, endorsements, everything. And if they start winning and, and honestly, I don't, I don't know half their players. I don't know. I know they got Carlos Hyde for the 49ers who the five, six times around to Carlos Hyde, he barely talked. So I see if he comes out. Um, but you know, um, I'm going to ask a question. To, to the people listening on this one. I, I've talked about my brother extensively on the show. I had one pass away uh, of a heroin overdose, and I had the other one got busted. And I, I read a comment, and I said it a couple weeks back. A guy was saying, you talk about your brother a lot. Sounds like you are really trying to play the victim when really it's your fault that everything's happened to you. And my brother just got sentenced last week, and he got a year in prison. And keep in mind, I've never said my brother's name on the air. And we don't have the same last name. So you can't tie us together. But my question is, I, I, I kind of want to write him a letter. Because I know he'll get it and I know he'll read it if he's in prison. And I have his address. I got what prison he's at. I got his, his, his number, his prison number. So I can write him. But one side of me says, write him a letter and just say you forgive him for everything. Uh, but it's such a hard thing to do when you know someone's going to read the letter and be like, what do you mean? What do you forgive me for what? That's so hard to do when you know that's what's going to happen. That's exactly what's going to happen. But it's interesting that my brother got locked up and I'm, I'm blocked from my mom's Facebook. All she's only got Facebook. That's her own social media, but I'm blocked from all of it, but I can still work around it and get somebody that knows her is, that isn't blocked and I can go to her page. So once every two, three months, I'll just go to her page and glance at it. Just almost like to see how she's doing. And the day my brother got sentenced, my mom put a quote out that said, just because a person makes one bad decision doesn't make them a bad person. And I went, Hmm, it's funny how it's okay for my brother to do that, but I didn't do anything bad and I'm banned. But I'm like, Oh, so again, you know, and, and to the guy that made the comment, and I told you, I re YouTube comments, I read. Uh, the one that said that, I was like, I got a feeling you know my brother. Or in some way, it's a family member that wrote that. <laughs> I just, I got a feeling. Because sometimes I'll post stuff, and uh, like last year I gave this kid a, a scholarship. I, I paid all four years for him to go to school. He's at Capital University in, in Columbus, Ohio. And somebody put a thumbs down on the video. Somebody po I, I posted a video of me giving the kid the scholarship. And I was just thinking, 
Who would put a thumbs down? Because you need to get the thumbs up and thumbs down on, on YouTube. Who would give somebody giving a kid that ain't, didn't have a break in life a full ride, four year scholarship, tax free? You ain't got to worry about nothing. You finish your four years of school, you're not going to have school loans to pay off. You're starting even, hopefully with a job and a degree. And you give that thumbs down. And I'm just thinking, all my posts on YouTube or anywhere, there's always one or two thumbs down. And I'm always thinking, hmm, it's just funny to me because I'm like, hmm, who will give a thumbs down to that? So my question is, and I, like I said, I read your guys' comments is, should I write him a letter? Should I? Because I got a feeling, well, one thing, he will read it. And two, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tackle, I'm not going to go at him like that. I wouldn't do that. But I would just tell him, um, it's, it's like what I told my, my brother before he passed away, the other one. I said, you know, you, you don't want a, another dad. You just want your dad to do better. And that's how I felt growing up when, when my dad wouldn't come around as much. I would always be like, damn, I don't want another dad. I just want my dad to do better. So when I would see like a guy tossing baseball with his dad or, uh, you know, guys going to their son's football games and stuff. And I look in the stands and say, I wish my dad was here. I never wanted their dad. I just wish my dad was there. And I remember when I remember my, uh, my junior year of high school, there was a guy named Peter Ellis. He was a black. We only had a three or four black kids on the football team, but Peter Ellis was a black kid. And he always looked up in the stands and he gave like a thumbs up to his mom and dad. They were at every game, home or away. They were always there. And I asked him one time, I said, Hey, Pete, who you be giving a thumbs up to? And he was like, my mom. And then uh, the next game, I saw him give thumbs up to his mom and his dad waved. And it was always right before kickoff. So I asked him, I said, yo, can I wave to your mom and dad? <laughs> and he went, what? I said, can I wave to your mom and dad? And he, he looked at me like, I don't care. So the next game, Pete like looks up in the stands and gives his mom thumbs up. And his dad, here I am right next to him waving. <laughs> Just like, and I, his mom gave me a wave like, who the fuck are you? <laughs> like, it was like the, the, you know, it was like a wave. Like you're just seeing your parents after the first day of school. So <laughs> I just there forget. I asked Pete, Hey, you think it's a wave of your mom and dad? <laughs> that was, that was the coolest brother in my high school, man. He was a year older than me to go to a, a rural all white high school. Like he did. Everybody like Pete, the rednecks like Pete. Everybody, like, he was just smooth, man. He was a smooth brother. I heard, I heard he's a lawyer now, like a real successful lawyer too. And I, I got to look him up, man. I'm going to try to find him, Peter Ellis. And uh, I heard the rumor was when he went to Michigan, Desmond Howard was there. And I don't know why when you live in a small town, that's a big deal. But it's like, yeah, you know, Pete cuts Desmond hair. I go, huh? They was like, the rumor was, yeah, Peter Ellis, he cuts Desmond Howard's hair because Desmond always had like cool haircuts in the early 90s when he was at Michigan. And the rumor was Peter was the one cutting his hair like in the dorm rooms. I guess they were staying in the same dorms up in Michigan. And Pete's one of those guys like I, I thought, and this is no lie, when I was in high school, I said, Peter Ellis is either going to be a preacher or a lawyer. And, and sure enough, he's a goddamn lawyer. I wouldn't be surprised if it's like a Feinberg and Ellis law firm out there. Yeah, I got, I got to see if I can find him. He's the type that probably wouldn't even be on social media. Like, he doesn't need it. He's like that smooth. I wish I was that cool that I wasn't worried about logging on to my phone or my laptop to see what people thought about me that day. That's that's how I picture Pete. Like, he probably ain't got shit. Probably probably got a, probably got a flip phone because he don't need all the technology. Man, I got a secretary to handle that shit. <laughs> you know who else has a flip phone? It's Alonzo Mourning. If you ever... Listen... If you ever see Alonzo Morning at a heat game or on the sidelines, he's on the phone. Look at look at the phone. It's a clip phone. And every time I see him, I'm like, so, hold on, hold on. You're now damn near part owner of the heat. Uh, you have a high school named after you. Uh, not to mention you're a Hall of Fame basketball player that did well with his money. Get a fucking phone, bro. Like <laughs> Before there's iPhones and everything, I don't think people realize how easy our life is now. I remember shooting Little Man up in Vancouver, and I had to get a burner phone up in Canada. And my, for one, I didn't have a laptop back then. This is, we shot this in 2005. So I didn't have a laptop. I was a little behind there. I didn't get on the business center to get online in the hotel. And then the burner phone didn't have any computers or apps. The only thing I could do was play blackjack. Cause I remember I, it rained every day. Of, it rained for 31 straight days when we shot little man. And I had a lot of days off. I remember my off days 
There was nothing to watch on TV. I started watching Degrassi Junior High. Drake was in a wheelchair. And I remember watching The Ultimate Fighter. It was the first scene of The Ultimate Fighter. And the thing about Canadian Sports Center, different than the United States, hockey is always the lead story. And they have a lot of boxing programs. Every day, there was a 30-minute boxing show on, on ESPN. And it was just dedicated to boxing. I was like, so I, I got into that. But man, those are some lonely days in my hotel room. Thank God for Tracy Morgan. Because when it rained and we couldn't shoot outside, Tracy was one floor above me. And he would just call me up, gee, come up. Let's hang out. There was just, and the bad part was there was a movie theater right across the street from the hotel. And there was just no good movies out. None. It was like, I think I saw two good movies the whole time I was there. It was right across the street from the hotel. 9% of the people, when they shoot a movie in Vancouver, they stay at a place called the Sutton Place. Because it has a hotel and it has apartments. And so we were at the Sutton place and I was just like, you, it's crazy because you'll be in the lobby and you'll see like all these different actors and actresses from different shows. I remember always seeing the cast from Supernatural and they were shooting, um, they were shooting one of the X-Men movies at that time. So it wouldn't be nothing to see half the cast of the X-Men in the lobby getting ready to go to work. Uh, I, I was always looking for Halle Berry, but I never saw her. I'm sure she wasn't staying at the Sutton place. Uh, yeah, but that, that was that was cool because every day you come down, you just don't know who you're going to see in the lobby because you're all going to different sets because usually just vans or SUVs are picking people up. And then one night, me and Tracy Morgan did a show. It was a Tuesday night. And we was like, let's just do a show. They had a comedy club called Yuck Yucks. It was right down the street from the hotel. So I went in there. I said, you know, me and Tracy want to do a show. They said, fine. So we, we booked, we did two shows. We sold out both shows. So the club only holds about 250, 300 people. But I remember we made some extra money while we were there. And, uh, and everybody came out, the whole cast of little man came out and all these other actors and actresses that was on these other shows came out to the show. And I was like, man, this is the most stars I've had at a comedy show. And it's not even in LA. This shit is in Vancouver. But hey, here's, here's what I remember the most about shooting little man. I had a development deal at Fox. So the whole time I'm in, I'm in Vancouver, I'm on the phone with these writers trying to get my show together. And I ended up walking away from the show because they had, Every joke was, was racial. It was like black, white, black, white. I said, dude, that's, that's an episode. That's not a, a show. So I walked away from, it. but the whole time I'm talking to Tracy about my show and I'm trying to come up with ideas and everything, characters and story ideas, and he's helping me. And then right when we're wrapping and we wrapped in February of 2006, we wrapped filming. We, we started in October. We filmed October all the way up to Thanksgiving. Then we came back for a few weeks in December, and then we was off till after the holidays. That's why it took so long to shoot the movie. Um, but as soon as we wrapped, Tracy goes, yo, gee, I just got a call from Tina Fey. He was like, yeah, I'm going to shoot this pilot for her. It was 30 Rock. So this whole, the whole time, I had the development deal. I'm trying to put this show together for Fox. And Tracy's really, you know, he, he, was, he would just help me out. Like, you think this is good? You think this idea? You think this is a good character? Yo, gee. And then we'd act it out in his room, act out the scenes. And then right when we wrapped February, he got the pilot. He said, yo, Tina Fey called because they had the SNL connection. He goes, we got this new pilot, man, called 30 Rock. And the rest is history. But I just remember thinking, he went that whole three months that we were together, not the whole time, but the whole time we shot the movie, never talked about a TV deal, never talked about getting on a TV show. And he gets a fucking phone call, man. That's how this business works, man. Like, he was literally, Tina knew him. And, and if you watch 30 Rock, that was Tracy. There's nobody else that can play that character. And he was playing Tracy Morgan. He wasn't playing somebody else. He was playing Tracy Morgan on 30 Rock. That's not a character. That's him. In this business, we can get frustrated. And, but I wouldn't trade it for the world because you can get a phone call tomorrow. You know, I just, I just got an email yesterday saying I got booked on ridiculousness. I'm filming it in June. Yeah, never. And that's just one episode of whatever, but I just, I want to do it to do it. I was just like, yeah, hell yeah, come in and do it. So I just, it, that's what I say. I love this business. I love it because you never know what tomorrow holds. You never know when your name's coming up in meetings. And a lot of times I don't know my name because of meetings. And at the last minute, they went with somebody else. Or sometimes I got something that somebody else thought they had. It's just how it works. So, all right, so, so listen, to, to, to just to recap the episode, listen to the family and friends of Siddiqui, Fuller and Spanky Horton, man, we lost two good guys in the comedy business. Good people. Quest chocolate chip cookies. Go to Target. Pick them up. You'll thank me later. Uh, and then should I or should I not write my brother? 
one letter while he's in prison. I, I think I'm going to, I'm leaning towards it. I just, it's hard when you write somebody and going to say, I forgive you for everything. And just, and just basically for myself, but you know, when they read it, I don't know though. I got to be careful how I word things. Cause my family on that side have a way of twisting things and turning things around. So I'm going to, I'm going to read your comments when, when this post and you guys tell me, uh, uh, I read all the YouTube comments. If you want to leave it on iTunes also, but you tell me what, what I should do, or maybe somebody that's listening has had that experience. I don't know. You got a you got a, a, a brother in prison that you don't get along with and has said some awful things about me. Uh, and I've never said anything bad about him, but I talked about his dad pretty bad. And I get it. He's defending his dad. But dad's fucking crazy. Step that's fucking crazy. So, all right, y'all. Well, uh, I'll see y'all next week. This is Gary Owen with the Get Some Podcast.